We're back in kindergarten, playing in the sandbox with other children. Each of you have your own permanent allotted space inside the sandbox to do anything you want. One day the kindergarten teacher announces a sandcastle building competition. You have one hour to build it and to get a prize the sandcastle has to be taller than one meter. The clock starts and you get to work. An hour later, the teacher tells all of you to stop and measure the sandcastles. Many of them surpass one meter, but yours is around 90 centimeters, so you don't get a prize. Whose fault is that? Well, it's yours, right? You had the time, you had the sand, others could do it, you couldn't. Thus, you cannot blame anything or anyone else. You are personally responsible for your sandcastle not reaching one meter. But what if, as you were building the sandcastle, another child kicked it over and you had to start again? Because of that, you couldn't build it tall enough in time and didn't get the prize. Are you personally responsible then? Most people would say no. So these are some clear-cut examples, but life is rarely that simple. Turns out, the sand inside the sandbox is not homogeneous. In some areas there is lots of cool, wet, sticky sand perfect for building. Other areas have less, some barely any. What if your allotted space has very little sand? Is it your fault that if you can't complete the task in time? Not really, right? Right? Obviously, the kindergarten teacher should have made sure that all kids have more equal amounts of sand to build with before announcing the competition. Or at the very least, there shouldn't be any gross differences. They could have dug up the sandbox a bit, mixed it up a bit, so the quality is more even. But if they did, parents of the children with lots of sand might come in the next day screaming, saying how nobody can redistribute any of their children's sand because it was them, the parents, who carried it there in buckets, and their parents before them, and so on, so their child can build the tallest, best-looking sandcastle now. They've built up all that generational sand and nobody has the right to take any of it. But if the teacher did redistribute the sand, it would only have been a minor inconvenience for the sand-rich children, but for the children with little sand it would have made all the difference. We know this because this has been standard practice in US kindergartens after World War II right until the Reagan administration, and it's standard practice right now in Europe producing better outcomes than in the US. On the other hand, even if a child has very little sand to start with, they can get some more from the janitor across the yard who has a big sand container, but doing so takes time and effort and some of it falls out of your container on the way. Also, the janitor doesn't give the same amount to everyone. If you have a study badge, he generally gives you a lot. If you don't, you get much less. But the thing is, in US kindergartens you can only get a study badge in exchange for a lot of sand. In European kindergartens, most children get study badges for free. For many US children with little to no sand to start with, a study badge is not an option. They are stuck with running back and forth between the sand container and the sandbox, carrying only smaller amounts in a toy bucket. What little they have is further diminished by them having to rent the playset, which contains the aforementioned toy bucket. If they don't want to rent a playset, they can always buy one, but especially in urban kindergartens, playsets are sold for exorbitant amounts of sand, thus are completely unaffordable for most children. They have to rent the playset, meaning they can only fill the toy bucket up to two-thirds, half or even one-third at a time. The rest is taken by the owner of the playset as rent. These owners are other children who then use the sand you give them to build their own sand castles higher. So the competition starts and the children with abundant sand start building immediately immediately. Other children with little sand start running back and forth between the sandbox and the sand container with partially full toy buckets. In addition, if they fall and hurt themselves during all the running around, the janitor will treat their injury only in exchange for a lot of sand. In Europe, the kindergarten teachers are responsible for the treating of wounds, not the janitors, and they do it in exchange for a small recurring sand contribution. After an hour, the competition is over. The children who started with lots of sand all have big, tall, nice-looking sand castles. The children who started with little to no sand have smaller sand castles despite having worked much harder. The children with lots of sand only had to run to the janitor for more sand once per minute. The children with little to no sand had to run twice or even three times, and yet the former group passed the one meter mark and got a prize while the latter didn't. And so the question is, are the children with little to no sand personally responsible for their failure? According to Ben Shapiro and people like him, yes. But for people who aren't rich sociopaths, the answer would be no. Clearly, the children's family background plays a huge role in whether they'll be successful or not, and family is one of those things you cannot choose. Ha, well, <clears throat> excuse me, liberal, uh, let's say a child is born into a poor family, uh, let's say very poor, very, very poor. Why doesn't the child just leave their family and get adopted by a richer family? They consider me sort of a widget in whatever ideology they're pushing, or, or they, they're considering the, the value of systems or not systems, but you sort of end around that. And I think that in many ways, that's what men, members of the left find so, so threatening, is because if you're a member of the left and you believe that all individuals are essentially just the outgrowths of institutions, and therefore that all change by individuals is going to be insufficient and that it must be societal change that, that creates individual change, you're a threat because you're telling people, well, you know, the systems can certainly get better, but the main threat to you is you. And that is a deeply threatening message to people. And if people find fulfillment in that message, 
then the left really does have a problem because if people start improving their lives within the system and not blaming the system for their problems and instead recognizing that that they can improve their lives, that's what mem- members of the left take most of all. You know, you talk about in the book, Jordan, the fact that people are constantly coming up to you and they're saying things like, you know, I, I was leading a, a dissolute life. I read your book. I started taking your advice and I've turned it around and now I'm doing much better in life. And, you know, I'm blessed to have much the same experience from a lot of people who listen to the show, people who have been homeless, who now have graduated Harvard Law School, people who were single moms and, and, then, de- and then decided to, to take a college course and, and figure out their lives, people who have made mistakes and turned their mistakes around. And to me, those are inspirational stories. I think that because those inspirational stories exist, that I think is why people find you to be such a threat. It's because so many people are inspired by the stuff that you say and change their life individually without putting all of their ire and focus on a system that the left is mainly focused on tearing down. I defy anyone to go read 10,000 comments on my YouTube channels. People like Ben Shapiro want to offer an individualist solution to a systemic problem. The extreme version of this argument would be the following. Imagine that during the days of slavery, one of the slaves complained about, well, being a slave. To which Ben Shapiro would respond by telling them to take personal responsibility and just escape to the north. Slavery, he'd say, will not be solved through big government overreach. That would be British imperialism. The north is there as an opportunity for anyone willing to take it. Clearly, the slaves in the south just aren't trying hard enough. I guess success stories all the time from slaves who did try hard and did escape to the north and are now living a happy and free life. But these woke abolitionists only want to talk about ending slavery on a federal level but ignore what the slaves themselves could do to change their own situation. Alright, now this is not to say that personal responsibility is not important. It is, obviously. Nobody is denying that. The idea that the left ignores personal responsibility is an imagined hypocrisy right-wing shoutmen can gesture towards. What percentage of the left ignores personal responsibility? Can we get some hard numbers, please? Individual anecdotes and Twitter screenshots aren't data, by the way. Some problems are too large and complex to be solved on an individual level. For example, the US obesity epidemic will not be solved through just encouraging people to eat healthy and work out more. The first half of the real solution is the authorities better regulating the food industry. What type of sugar can be used, how many grams per unit can be in our food stuff, giving tax incentives to healthier products, limiting the amount of saturated fats per serving, and so on. The other part of this solution is creating walkable cities where people People don't sit in their cars for two to four hours per day, but walk or cycle to the store, to work, or to public transportation. Once you have the systemic solutions in progress, then you can start with the individualistic solutions parallel to it. So remember, when it comes to large, complex problems, individual approach for rare exceptions, and systemic approach for results. In the meantime, thank you for watching, and don't forget to like and subscribe. And a special thanks to the artist Soleimane T, who created this awesome thumbnail for this video. You'll find the link to his Instagram in the description, and I'll be seeing you next time.